It's sad but true. Most of those things people return to stores have no way back to clients. A sad fate awaits unnecessary abandoned t-shirts, bags, shoes, and other stuff. And here's why. Let's have a look at the tragic story of a pair of sneakers. First, factory workers make these sneakers. Then they put them in a box. Later, huge containers get loaded with shoes and clothes and put them on airplanes, ships, trucks, and trains to distribute worldwide. Then, the sneakers get to the sorting center of a clothing store and, finally, appear on the site of this store. At this moment, Evelyn is sitting at her computer. She sees a new model of sneakers and presses the buy button. Workers transport the shoes and other stuff to a delivery service within the next few days. And finally, couriers deliver them to clients all over the city. The doorbell rings. Happy, Evelyn runs to open the door. A courier of a large online store is standing outside. He gives Evelyn a box with her new designer sneakers. She's thrilled. The shoes have a stylish design and are satisfyingly bright. It seems they fit perfectly on her feet. A couple of days pass, and Evelyn decides to return the shoes. For some unknown reason, she doesn't like the sneakers anymore. She gets her money back and gives the shoes to a delivery man. Evelyn has worn them only twice, indoors to test them. She hasn't stained the sneakers or damaged them. They look perfect. They smell like new shoes. It seems there shouldn't be any problem in returning them back to the shop and selling them to a new customer at a good discount. This is a great option, but the courier puts Evelyn's sneakers in the back of his van. He goes to other clients to pick up more return goods. At the end of the day, the van is full. He brings all the things to the company's warehouse. Then all the return clothes and shoes get transported to a landfill and are just burned. It's a sad picture when so many almost new things get destroyed. Stores do this not because such things are not good enough to sell them again, but because it's unprofitable to return them to the catalog. The best-case scenario would go like this. Evelyn gives the shoes away. The courier brings them to the warehouse. Then a specialist examines them for damage. If everything is fine, the returned sneakers go back into a box. They appear on the website, now with a huge discount. A new client buys them, and everybody's happy. But unfortunately, this is impossible. All this reverse logistics takes effort. Transporting things back to the warehouse, sorting, examining, and repackaging them. All this takes a lot of time and money. It's not profitable for stores to put these sneakers back on sale. It's easier to simply get rid of them. Actually, this reverse logistics would work if there weren't so many refunds. But according to statistics, people return about 15-30% to of things they buy in internet stores. Even worse, there are people who return recently bought items all the time. For example, they buy a jumper, wear it to a party, and then return this piece of clothing because they no longer need it. Then they buy something new and return it again. But companies are constantly tracking such free shopping, so no one can keep doing this for long. Anyway. 30% of returns is still a huge number. It's hundreds of millions of different things. And they all accumulate in warehouses. How much money do companies need to spend to sort this stuff out? Workers have to inspect them and repack. How much money is spent on gas to deliver all these things? Clothes can get stained or spoiled during transportation. If a customer returns a product without packaging, companies need to buy a new box. These processes are not too expensive if you own a small shop and sell things in the neighborhood. But what if you have tons of returned items? You need to check which part of these clothes or shoes is not damaged. Then, you have to deliver these goods to other cities or even countries. It might take weeks to do this, and all this time and effort must be paid for. And when something gets back to the store, it usually costs much cheaper than before. It's very unprofitable for the producer. Reverse logistics are costly. Yes, if returned items are expensive, this whole process can make sense. But as a rule, most return things are cheap, and the price for reverse logistics is higher than the cost of these things. Many other products, such as cosmetics, underwear, and swimsuits, get destroyed immediately. Returning them to shop shelves don't comply with sanitary standards. But such items are also more difficult to return. If these products don't have any damage or defects, you won't get your money back. 
So why do stores make a refund at all if it's so unprofitable? The answer is simple. They fight for clients. The opportunity to get a refund is an attractive feature for buyers. Stores without this function will quickly lose their position on the market. The money businesses lose is not such a big problem compared to the profit from actually selling their products. At the same time, companies may not only destroy their goods. Some sellers and store employees resell returned items unofficially. For example, they might offer their customers to buy things from unknown sites. And some big stores can return items back to clothing brands with partial refunds. Also, companies sometimes load return things into huge containers and ship them to other countries. Local stores buy these clothes in bulk at a low price and then sell them to people at a much higher price. Of course, the best course of action would be to give unnecessary things to those in need. Unfortunately, many companies are against doing it. They call it brand dilution. If almost anyone could wear clothes from some well-known and expensive clothing manufacturer, it'd be bad for the brand's reputation. It's not fair, but it's business. Some stores do give away returned goods, but it happens not so often. But what if big, inexpensive clothing stores could simply take those piles of returned things and leave them in the street for everyone in need? It sounds simple, but this may lead to many problems. First, it's necessary to coordinate such actions with clothing brands. Then, you need to choose a platform for doing this and hire people who will give clothes away. It's necessary to consider the infrastructure of the area and many other things. Now, in a perfect world, producers could use all return things as raw materials for making new ones. Imagine you give away an unnecessary shirt, and manufacturers use its fabric to create something new. But this is unlikely to happen in the nearest future. Such recycling of used material is too costly. Some small companies do it. They buy raw materials and unnecessary things from large manufacturers, then use them to make new clothes and sell them under their own brand. Many people who want to return their goods resell them on different sites. They post an ad and wait for a buyer. You don't have to go to a shopping mall to buy something new. Try getting something you like from a reliable private seller on the internet. Right, now you know everything about return things. But what about lost luggage? Things forgotten at airports are taken to special centers. There, they're waiting for their owners. If no one rescues a bag or another item for three months, employees put them up for sale in special stores. All lost items are sold at a big discount. Jewelry, appliances, clothes, books, you name it. One of the biggest and most famous stores is in Scottsboro, Alabama. Millions of different products are sold there. Shoes and gadgets, gems and construction equipment. And all this costs much cheaper than in a regular store. In 1970, an entrepreneur found some left luggage at a bus stop and decided to sell it. He thought about all the stuff people lose all over the world. At this moment, he came up with an idea to create a store selling lost things. The idea evolved and turned the city into a place where you can find stuff you lost at an airport long ago. And you can also visit it if you want to buy something you need at a low price. But don't worry, airlines don't simply send your luggage to such stores. First, they do their best to return lost things to their owners. And who tried to bring an appliance onto an airplane? What was it, a refrigerator or a stove? There's a good reason the checkout lines are so tight. Let's say you're waiting there, and after you take one more look at your cart, you see there are certain things you don't really need, so it would be better not to buy them. So you're looking around trying to find a spot to leave them somewhere aside. Good luck with that. Checkout lines are designed like this so you can't find a place to put these items down. So you make the subconscious decision to buy all these things after all. Take a closer look at your cart before getting there or just stick to the list to avoid this. Also, the checkout line is probably the most tempting part of the supermarket. All those candies, shiny magazines, gums, and cool gadgets are there to grab your attention while you're patiently waiting your turn. Many people just automatically grab something from there while waiting, even though they weren't planning to buy it in the first place. Have you ever seen someone in front of the supermarket washing the shopping carts? Of course not, because no one does it. Yep, shopping carts are really filthy. 
So many people touch them during just one day, let alone this whole time they have been in the store. It would be good to wash your hands every time after shopping, or you can wipe the handle down before using it. You'll see some stores have wipes right next to the entrance. Spraying water makes fruits and vegetables look pretty. Plus, it adds weight to them, so you might end up paying more for them. These are the two actual reasons why workers spray them with water. No one does it to keep them fresh. Plus, spraying water won't keep fruit and vegetables fresh. It will just make them rot more quickly. Spraying water on them or not, wash all the fresh fruits and vegetables you buy. You know how you sometimes like to pick up a pear or a peach to see if they're ripe enough and put them back down if not? Well, you're not the only one who thought of that, so stick to washing your hands every single time you come back from the store. Check out the packages of fruits, vegetables, and meat you're buying. Even though you have to be prepared, you won't be able to see everything that's inside. One Reddit user took a picture of bacon so others can see what the visible slice looks like versus the rest of those packed in a way you can't see them well. Another user shared an interesting trick to help them feel how much meat a pack of bacon actually has. And this only works at low temperatures. So the fatty bits become stiffer before the meat does when the bacon is cold enough. That way, if you pick a cold pack of bacon that's kind of stiff and hard to bend, you have one full of fat. If you feel it's kind of squishy and you're able to fold it in half relatively easy, it means there's more meat and less fat. Here's one more interesting Reddit catch. It's not a hack supermarkets use. It's more like a bonus on your vegetables. A whole new ecosystem on your veggies. It's for those situations when you want some extra flavors but are running out of ideas. Fish you buy in supermarkets is often mislabeled. When it comes to meat, it's pretty lax with testing because you can tell the difference between, let's say, pork and beef relatively easily. But it's harder to do it with fish. Some studies showed that a third of all fish on the market is not labeled properly. That means some expensive pieces such as salmon are replaced by other fish that look similar. The majority of that counterfeit fish is safe to eat, but there are some of it, such as snake mackerel, that can cause not so pleasant stomach issues. Don't trust expiration dates so blindly either. Of course, there's a certain number of weeks milk can remain good after packaging, but supermarket meat departments are a different story. They do their labeling there with their own devices, which means regulations are not that strict. In other words, if an item is about to expire, but it still looks good, supermarkets can simply put a new label on it. That means they can extend the expiration date for a couple of days, sometimes even more than a week. If possible, look for the food at the time when it first comes to the shelves, or find some trusted butcher nearby. But if you stumble upon meat or something else that's about to expire or has already passed the due date, you can negotiate for a better price. Just show the product to the staff, and in most cases, they'll be willing to lower the price. They'll probably have to put it on the discount anyway, so this way, it's just easier for them and better for you. So always check the expiration date. Pay attention to this because supermarkets mostly won't get shut down after they fail an inspection. Inspections are way more focused on restaurants, so you're more likely to hear a restaurant closed because they fail health standards rather than a grocery store. So going to a small local bakery instead of buying supermarket bread and generally trying smaller local businesses might not be a bad idea. These guys usually care a lot about their reputation. This hack grocery stores use is not so gross, but it's still worth knowing. They mostly place expensive stuff at eye level. Most of the population is right-handed, so most of us do the same movement reaching for stuff we want to buy. So things that will bring supermarkets the most profit are right there, at eye level, front and center. Sometimes, there will even be some additional colorful markups on these more expensive products that will make you buy them before even checking the others. So, look to the side and look up to find better deals. Don't just grab the first thing that gets into your visual field. Also, 
things that are geared towards kids are placed a little bit lower, so they're at eye level too. One Redditor shared a photo from one supermarket where they had to cut out the bottom of laundry baskets so shoplifters don't fill them up and walk out. Another commentator said this is just a display version. That way, if you want to make a purchase, employees will go to the back room and send the basket to the registers for when you're ready to pay. It feels so exciting when you're going through those colorful newspaper inserts with special discounts. But they don't make these to save you money. Their main purpose is to make you buy things you don't really need, but you'll get them anyway because you believe they're on sale. Double check all the coupons you're about to use. Sometimes the special price they advertise is the same as the regular price without the coupon. Bulk buying deals might sound great at first, but they can be a trap. First, the price difference between individual products and those in bulk doesn't have to be that big. And you might end up buying way more stuff than you need. That means that either you'll buy too much, so the items might go bad before you have a chance to use them, or you might eat and drink way more than you usually would. And neither of these options sounds good, and it's definitely not saving money. For example, one Reddit user noticed there's a pack of four blades instead of five, even though the price is the same and they haven't even changed the packaging. Check the prices of packages considering their weights too. One Redditor shared a photo of their catch, which might be tasty, but also quite expensive considering the size of the package. They usually shop for groceries online, and since this week was pretty stressful, they were tired and didn't check how tiny this block of cheese was. Well, it's a nice Sunday afternoon and you're shopping at your regular grocery store when you stumble upon a bloated package in the fresh produce aisle. You check the product information. It seems well within its expiration date. Then why the unusual shape, you may wonder? The answer is not always straightforward. For some types of fresh products, such as meat, fish, or seafood, sometimes even salads and cheese, scientists came up with something called MAP, or Modified Atmosphere Packaging, to ensure that these types of products with a relatively short shelf life stay fresh for as long as possible. A combination of gases is introduced in the packaging. It happens even before the product reaches your local grocery store. A French professor at the Montpelier School of Pharmacy stumbled upon this method after he noticed that fruits tend to stay fresh for longer periods of time in low oxygen storage conditions. The types of gases in MAPS packaging can vary from product to product, but the main idea is to replace or reduce the content of oxygen. It's generally replaced with either nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Keep in mind that just because a bloated bag mm. of salad is within its expiration date, it doesn't mean it's always safe to eat. The gases inside the bag may very well be there for their own purpose, but they can also be a sign that the product is spoiled. That's why the best course of action when shopping would be to check if the product is not expired. If it's still within the day, mm -hmm. check for any unusual odors or damage to mm -hmm. the packaging. If something seems off, it's best not to risk it. You can reach out to hey. any of the store staff if you have any questions or concerns. Most supermarkets these days have a layout which allows for a logical shopping order, like buying non-perishable items first, then adding refrigerated or frozen products. Fruits and vegetables should come last since you won't want them at the bottom of your shopping cart. Nobody likes a squished tomato. While I'm on the subject of fruits and veggies, try to get them earlier in the morning if possible. Veggies that have been sitting out all day may lose some of their shape and texture, while others may be a bit wilted away. Quick tip on waste management, never buy more produce than you intend to use in a week. Most fruits and vegetables don't even last that long, so it's best not to give in to cravings. Shopping on a full stomach might help with that as well, just as much as going shopping with a pre-made list of things you need to buy. Thoroughly inspecting the package of every product might save you some hustle later as well. Refrigerated products need to feel cold to the touch, whilst frozen ones need to be solid and with no sign of leakage. 
When you get home, make sure you refrigerate all the necessary items as soon as possible. Generally, they shouldn't be out of the refrigerator for more than two hours. Otherwise, their quality won't stay the same. Buying potted herbs from the grocery store may not be the first thing on your list, but it's surely something to consider. Not only are they available for a fraction of the cost, but they're also easy to grow and take care of. Just picture a nice herb garden right there on your balcony or even in the kitchen. Wouldn't that be nice? You'll always have fresh basil to top a mouth-watering pasta dish. Since you're still at the grocery store, pick up some coffee filters while you're at it. You may not have a machine at home that actually uses filters, but there are a lot more things you can use them for around the house. They can be used for straining liquids, safely stacking delicate china in your cupboards, or even polishing windows, or shoes for that matter. If your favorite fruits and vegetables are on sale, but buying large quantities would mean they go to waste, consider freezing them. You can stock up on items for smoothies, especially for the colder season when there are limited options for fresh fruits. And don't just grab the first thing on the shelf, especially if it's likely to go bad quickly. Stores restock their produce following a first-in, first-out layout. So the items at the back of the shelf will always be a tad bit fresher. The same goes for tea if you prefer it to coffee. Switch to buying loose-leaf tea, and you'll not only reduce the cost, you'll also be able to make your own homemade tea blends. Loose-leaf tea also has a stronger flavor than tea sold in tea bags. As for the other household stuff, Stock up on items such as light bulbs, paper towels, or batteries. Chances are you'll always be needing at least one of these items, so it's best to buy them in larger quantities when on sale. They never go to waste, and let's face it, it's always annoying when you run out of batteries at home and your TV remote stops working. Hey, tell me about it. Try to reduce the number of times you go to the grocery store to buy just one item. It's inefficient, and most likely, you'll end up buying things that you don't actually need. Uh, That shopping list starts to make a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Another list worth making, the one containing whatever you have in the fridge. Try to create such a list at least twice a week. Meal planning for at least a week in advance will also help you reduce impulse buying. If you already know what you'll want for dinner on Wednesday, why add anything else to the cart if it's unnecessary? At the same time, start getting creative with your leftovers. There's no need for them to go to waste when you can mix and match or add some additional herbs and flavors to spice them up. Store leftovers in transparent containers for added visibility, and don't be afraid to set out a leftover day during the week. It's also nice to look at them as ingredients rather than leftovers. Use extra leftover pasta or steamed vegetables for a frittata or an (laughs) omelette. Blend together cooked vegetables with some tomatoes to create a pasta sauce. Put together some wraps for the next day's lunch with anything from leftover cooked rice to meat and vegetables. Or, if you're really looking for the easiest method to save leftovers, you can always turn them into soup. Last night's vegetable side dish can turn into a wholesome lunch if you simply add a can of broth and blend it all together. Even a two-day-old loaf of bread can be salvaged if you cut it diagonally, sprinkle the slices with some herbs and olive oil, and pop them in the oven for a couple of minutes. You'll then have yourself some nice homemade croutons for that previously mentioned soup. A little label know-how never hurt anyone either. Be on the lookout for ingredients you've never heard of or those you can't pronounce. An item that usually has more than five ingredients listed on the packaging should be avoided. Even the way you carry your groceries in the supermarket can affect how and what you buy. If you prefer baskets to shopping carts, you're more prone to impulse searches. That's what a study published by the Journal of Marketing Research claims. It happens due to the effort you put in actually carrying the items around. Choosing a shopping cart will most likely make you comfortable enough to browse through enough products and read labels thoroughly. When your grocery list is not too big, go for the self-checkout aisle if available. Studies have shown that impulse purchases are lowered by up to 32% if you actually scan your own items on the way out. That's because the regular checkout line is specially designed to keep you from letting go of any items you might have reconsidered buying. There's literally nowhere you can put down your undesired products outside of your grocery cart, and if there's anyone else waiting in line behind you, good luck sliding out. 
The food arrangement on the shelves can also pose a threat to both your budget and your habits. Since people are more inclined to buy the items they see first, the most expensive products are placed at eye level, and the budget options are placed on the top and bottom shelf. Take your time and scan your aisles of interest. You'll be surprised to see that most items placed on higher or lower shelves are often not only more cost-effective, but also less packed with additives or artificial flavor. Hey, be careful. It's a jungle in there. Supermarket shopping carts usually look simple, but they hide tons of secrets. They often shake when moving and sometimes even make loud clinking noises. But that's not because they're old or of bad quality. This is a psychological trick. The faster you walk, the louder the noise the cart makes. Trying to produce as little noise as you can, you start walking more slowly. And, of course, you can't but pay attention to all that yummy stuff on the shelves. And if some of it ends up in your cart, well, you can't blame yourself, right? Another trick supermarkets use to make you buy more is the size of carts. They're usually extra large, and you'll subconsciously take more products to fill all that space. Now, have you ever noticed that shopping cart wheels often wobble? Even worse, there's almost always that one wobbly wheel that makes it impossible to steer the cart, and you have to go back to switch it. Shopping carts have caster wheels. Those are mounted on the bottom of large objects so that you can move them around more easily. But over time, casters develop flutter. It causes the wheel to swivel back and forth. This is kind of inconvenient since such flutter can make your cart move in an unwanted direction. Interestingly, flutters are less likely to occur when you're moving slowly. So, can it be that supermarkets don't repair fluttering wheels because they want customers to move around at a more leisurely pace? Just a thought. The black lines on the basketball make it easier to use. They're actually grooves helping you to handle the ball. And since players need to move around the court while bouncing the ball, control is crucial. Those pebbled dots that cover the outside of the ball serve the same purpose. Do you have an eye for detail? Then you might have noticed a strange looking notch at the bottom of some plastic bottles. It's called a deco lug, and it helps to indicate the placement of a bottle sticker or some artwork. Without it, stickers on mass-produced plastic bottles won't look as pretty and symmetrical as they usually do. Most plastic coffee cup lids have a tiny hole in them. When you take a sip from a cup closed with a lid, the air pressure inside the cup drops. And some air from the outside tries to push into the cup. The tiny hole in the lid allows the air to enter. It also helps the liquid go out of the main bigger hole more smoothly. Plus, the smaller hole acts as an exit for steam gathering inside the cup, which prevents the lid from melting. Those of you who have a ceiling fan, do you know it can move in more than one direction? One mode is for the summer, the other for the winter. When the weather is hot, ceiling fans should move counterclockwise. This makes them pull the warm air up and push the cold air down. And the clockwise winter mode pushes the warm air down and helps the cool air rise. Do you still use a knife to remove strawberry stems? But this way, you throw away a lot of the stuff you could otherwise eat. Instead of a knife, try a regular drinking straw. Insert one end of the straw into the bottom of the strawberry and push it gently all the way through. The straw will pop the stem out. A little groove on the bottom of a cup lets cool air get underneath it, which saves the glass or ceramics from cracking when a scorching beverage heats it up. And when you place cups upside down in the dishwasher, the groove stops water from gathering in the cup's bottoms. A button on the back of a collar of a button-down shirt is there to prevent your tie from sticking out. And the small loop on the back can be used to hang the shirt without wrinkling it. Barcode readers scan not black, but white lines. The reader emits rays of light that fall on the product's barcode. When it happens, the white areas reflect this light, while the dark zones absorb it. The reflected light helps the device to read the code and give you some information about the product. White is the most popular color for painting aircraft. It reflects sunlight most effectively, and planes don't heat up too much. 
all kinds of cracks or dents are much more visible on the white background. It means issues can be spotted and repaired as fast as possible. And finally, it costs less to buy white-colored airplanes because it's the color they have at birth. Some keyboards come with little legs. Thanks to them, you can tilt your keyboard and see which keys you're hitting. But keep in mind that a flat keyboard doesn't make your wrist so tired. And if you can touch type, you don't need to look at the keyboard anyway. Let's say you're driving on a highway. When it's time to make an exit, pay attention to highway signs. If the sign for your destination is on the left, your exit will be on the left too, and vice versa. You might have noticed that the sides of some cotton pads have different textures. One surface is firmer and more absorbent. It's supposed to be used with nail polish remover. The other side is way finer and softer. You can use it to remove makeup. You often see that cups on small tubes are hollow on top with a little spike inside. The purpose of this spike is to break the foil sticker sealing the tube. The neck of the tube fits right in the hole and the spike breaks the seal. No need to struggle trying to tear the tiny foil seal off with your fingers or even your teeth. The hole near the rim of your bathroom sink is there to prevent overflows. Thanks to it, all excess water goes into the siphon. Plus, it helps your sink drain faster. The hole gives air gathered in the siphon room to escape. Let's say you're reading a paper book, but when you decide to take a break, you realize you don't have a bookmark. Is leaving a dog ear your only choice? Nope, that's what the dust jacket is for. Turns out, providing you with the information about the book and its author isn't its only purpose. Most kitchen shears have metal plier-like teeth in the middle, between the handle grips. They can help you crack nuts, crab shells, and other tough products. You can also open jars and bottles or remove herb stems with their help. The bubbles in your soda push the straw up, but you can keep it from rising by pushing it through the hole in the metal pull ring. The correct way to break off a piece of Toblerone chocolate bar is by pushing the pointy side inwards towards the rest of the bar. Bottles have long necks so that your drink stays cool longer. Hold the neck, not the bottle itself and your drink won't warm up. Place a wooden spoon across the top of a pot with pasta. It'll prevent the bubbles from escaping. Once they touch the spoon's water-repelling surface, they'll immediately retreat back into the pot. If you turn over a Tupperware container, you'll see lots of symbols. They'll inform you whether the container is dishwasher, microwave, or freezer safe. You're also likely to find out how you should recycle the thing. The black grate on microwaves is called a Faraday shield. It keeps the electromagnetic energy inside the device. The grate also speeds up the heating process, and it can block phone signals too. If you don't remember which side of your car the gas tank is on, check the fuel gauge on the dashboard. There must be a little gas pump with an arrow pointing to the left or right. It indicates the side you should choose before pulling up towards the pump. You're staring at the supermarket shelf, thirsty for some water. You'll probably pick the brand you always buy or get the cheapest one there. But wait, next time you buy a water bottle, make sure to check this out. Now, did you know that before you purchase anything that comes in a plastic bottle, the first thing you should do is look at the bottom? That's right, turn it over and look for the recycle symbol with a number inside of it. These numbered triangles actually indicate what kind of plastic was used in the production of your bottle. So, if it's marked with the number 1, know that it's only safe for single use. It means that if you let your bottle be exposed to sunlight and warmer temperatures, it will most likely start releasing toxic substances into your liquid. And drinking that will not be fun for you at all. Now, if the number inside is a 3 or a 7, best to avoid it in general. This is so because these bottles will most likely already be releasing chemicals that penetrate your drinks or food. And, as we know, lengthy exposure to it can result in severe health problems. Best to keep on the lookout for numbers 2, 4, 5, or the letters PP. These are the safest ones to consume from. They are suitable for multiple uses, and you can store them for a long time.
But remember, store mainly cold water inside of them and disinfect them from time to time. Putting any type of hot liquid inside of water bottles will mean the liquid inside will absorb the chemicals from the plastic. And still on the topic of plastic bottles, when you see packs of them bundled together by plastic, don't be shy. Open it up and grab as many bottles as you planned on buying. Supermarkets do this as a strategy, since they know that consumers are oftentimes lazy to rip the plastic and end up taking an entire pack of water or soda just to avoid the extra hassle. Now you've moved on to the refrigerated section of the supermarket. You look at all the cheese and wonder which one to take. Well, don't buy the ones that come in little slices separated by plastic. Maybe we shouldn't even call this cheese. As the content of actual cheese is less than 51%, the manufacturers actually have to label them cheese product instead of cheese. And if you look for the fine print, you'll find this stamped somewhere in the packaging. When you're buying hard cheese, you should pay attention to its color, textures, and above all, the holes. First, the cheese must be uniform and without a white crust. And instead of picking cheese that has uneven and asymmetrical holes on it, you should go for the ones whose holes are evenly distributed on the whole chunk of cheese. Oh yeah, and before buying, try squeezing the cheese. It should immediately restore its shape. And there you go, you've got the perfect cheese to buy. Then fish. When picking it, make sure you take a good look at its eyes. And no, it shouldn't be love at first sight. You just need to check if the fish's eye is bright. Clouded and bulging eyes mean that the fish is old and probably past its consuming period. And for the meat lovers out there, make sure you're not buying glued meat. Oh yeah, you heard it correctly. Meat manufacturers have developed the habit of gluing together some pieces of meat before selling them. With the help of a little white powder, manufacturers glue together small pieces of meat in order to sell higher quantities of meat. It stretches the meat supply and helps meat producers to save money by reducing the waste of smaller pieces of meat. To make sure you're not buying glued meat, make sure to look for cracks in packaged meats. Even if that glue can put together meat fiber, it won't hold the fat. So if you've got cracks in the fat, that means that someone tried to glue together two or more pieces of meat. And even if you spot some cracks on the fiber, that can be the glue wearing off. Try this shopping hack and never buy glued meat ever again. Then kiwis. Don't buy them if they're way too soft. As it happens, kiwis that are super soft are also extra rotten or overripe. Well, maybe extra rotten isn't something that actually exists, but you get the idea. When kiwis get too soft, they release something called ethylene, which gives the fruit terrible acidity. To know which ones to buy, press your fingers against them and check their consistency. If your finger dips too much, it's a bad sign. But if it dips just a little and the fruit quickly recomposes itself, that's the point you're looking for. Now, if you're trying to eat healthy, don't buy anything packaged that has more than five ingredients to it. The baseline is the more ingredients in a packaged food, the more highly processed it probably is. Of course, the quality of these five ingredients also counts but do give it a count next time you're choosing what to buy. Potato chips. Who doesn't love a good crunch? Well, but did you know that most of the packaged potato chips are actually composed of only 42% of potatoes? In the end, it's your choice. But if I were you, I wouldn't buy them. Check to see the ingredients before cracking them open. And those pre-packaged bags of vegetables that tell you they have 8 pounds of potatoes or carrots or apples inside of them? Do you think they really carry the amount they're selling you? As it turns out, no! You can check each bag with a luggage scale to see how much they actually weigh. But usually, those 8 pounds turn out to be 6. And on it goes. It's not that supermarkets are trying to trick us, but it happens that these bags are usually filled in a hurry by packagers. Sometimes, they don't really weigh the amount of produce they're putting into these 8-pound bags. Now, even if you prefer the pink-colored razor blade, don't buy it. Have you ever heard of something called the pink tax? As it turns out, goods that are made for women and girls end up costing 7% more than the same product made for the men and boys market share. 
it's believed that women are better customers and will pay the extra price for the same products. But if you're looking to save some money, just buy the blue ones. Now, before you buy fresh produce, make sure you take a good look at the PLU codes. In case you don't know, PLU codes are four-digit or five-digit numbers that appear on a small sticker that is applied to individual pieces of produce in the USA. A four-digit code means that the produce was grown in a traditional rather than organic way. Make sure you do take a look at each individual product before they can get mismatched on the shelves. Now, five-digit codes that begin with the number 9 almost always indicate that the product was grown organically. So, if you're looking for organic produce, these ones are the way to go. Never buy green potatoes. Green potatoes are something that actually does exist, and even if most of them never make it to the store, be aware. Green potatoes can cause health problems and are far from the best quality of potato to be ingested. They become green because they weren't stored properly or they were way too exposed to sunlight. The green in them is an indication of certain levels of toxins that are harmful to humans, so steer away from those. Don't buy coffee that is older than 18 months. Look at the best before date when shopping. And if you get the chance, prefer whole beans rather than grounded coffee powder. The beans preserve the antioxidant properties from the coffee, and grounding them up just before drinking them is usually the best way to benefit from all the healing qualities of coffee. And last but not least, do your online shopping between Tuesday and Thursday. It may sound strange, but studies have shown that the best way to catch up on really good deals is to shop between these days. Prices are as low as they can get, and if you're looking to save money, forget Sundays. That's a total no-go.